Are you praying for Metro? We are in need of your prayers. Let's do so at this time. Mighty God, Lord, we come before you thankful for the, for the love that you have shown us so richly, so powerfully, so fully. God, it's easy to be people of hardship, to be people of struggle, to be people of worry, to be people who are simply trying to get by. But God, give us lives based in you upon your love. Help us to be men and women of love who not only receive love but return it richly. Bless us always. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I've talked about love a lot in the last few weeks in our Bible class and some videos we've been recording for Apologetics Underground, which is still on its way. Uh, we're getting ready to launch here in the next few weeks. But we've been talking a lot about love, and I decided to kind of, as we're transitioning into kind of a, a similar topic but a new topic in our Sunday morning adult Bible class, I decided to use this sermon as kind of like a, an end cap to the discussions I've been having with you in person and from up here and, and behind the podium and, and Bible class and behind uh, the cam- in front of the camera. This, these couple of weeks I've been talking about this topic have been very influential on me. They've been very thought-provoking for me. They've been very um, faith-deepening for me. And I decided to talk to you about love as kind of like sew some of these things up by, of course, reading for you, having read for you the most famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You see it on signs of football games. You see it on the bottom of fast food cups. You you see it on bumper stickers, t-shirts. Computer wallpapers, you see this one everywhere. But have you really thought about it? Because the Bible, in its essence, is really a love story. It is the love story of God showing His love to His creation. And I've thought a lot about love. Now, normally we don't do audience participation. Uh, Sunday morning in a sermon, but I thought we'd we'd shake things up just a little bit. Um, Stephanie is not allowed to answer this question because she, are, I know she knows the answer to this question. What is the purest form of love? Love in all of its aspects. What is the purest form of love? Love at its at its fullest, its most intense. Mother and child, pretty good. Sacrificial, also really good. Anybody else? Agape, unconditional cheater. (laughs) Preacher's kid for you. No, uh, still not the one I'm looking for, but also very good. God, ooh, see, that's the standard Sunday school answer, isn't it? What's the answer to this question, kids? Jesus! And you can't, you're not wrong. He's like, what's she going to say? No! (laughs) incorrect let me tell you a love story that I believe perfectly illustrates the purest form of love the year was 1999 the summer of 1999 I was at with many of my friends as we did every year growing up at YBC Yosemite Bible Camp in Yosemite Park in California um, Stan Craig, who was here a couple of weeks ago, a preacher at Holmes Road, was my youth minister at the time. He was assistant director for camp that year. He was also my camp, my camp counselor. Um, Stan, who many of you met when he was here for our evenings at Metro series, one of the things he did is he, w- he was kind of well known among the youth group for doing was he gave all the guys nicknames. If you got to know Stan, if you knew Stan for longer than, say, a day or two, you got a nickname. No, I am not telling you what mine was. One kid in particular, who we had only known 
for this week because he had just come to camp. He wasn't a regular member of our youth group. One kid in particular, his last name, forget his first name, but his last name was Wichapool. Wichapool. Stan, in his genius, decided that this young man's nickname would therefore become Coolpool. C-O-O-L space P-O-O-L. Coolpool. The thing about Coolpool was, Coolpool, a nice boy, not if, look, and this isn't me being unkind, because number one, you don't know him, and two, he, we're all awkward teenagers at some point. Coolpool was not the most handsome young man on the planet. Coolpool had a little bit of a lanky problem, a little bit of a acne problem, and a little bit of a facial hair problem, in the sense that he only barely had it. So he was awkward, like so many of us are. I'm sure he's fine now, wherever he is. But he, at the time, looked kind of awkward and just was kind of nervous. He was a quiet young man. Um, now, it was easy to be quiet on our youth group because you had guys like me and my buddy Jeff and my buddy Chris. All three of us were very loud, bombastic personalities, and we tended to, to, you know, kind of control the rooms we were in. So he just kind of hung out in the corner. He just kind of, you know, went along with the crowd. And we hung out with Coolpool. We liked him. He was funny, and he got along with all of us, and we just kind of brought him into our group. We were loving Christians that way. But there's a reason why you go to church Bible camp. And it's not Jesus. It's the girls that go to church Bible camp. <laughs> and all of us were, were keenly aware of the presence of these girls at church Bible camp. And so we had developed a system where we would go down to the basketball court every day where the girls would hang out on the picnic tables next to the court in the trees. And we would play basketball. Y'all, I hate basketball. <laughs> but I was there every day. I was awful at it, but I was there because that's what you did. Now, I want to describe to you the basketball court. The basketball court itself was a dirt court. It had, a reg it had two regulation size, full court dirt, two regulation size baskets, okay, at their proper height. Um, we were terrible, <laughs> but it was packed hard earth, surrounded by a copse of trees on one side and open to the field on the other. And on both sides, one, the, one with the, side with, the one side with the trees and the side open, they had these wooden picnic tables. Now, these wooden picnic tables, I don't know how long, they're probably still there. I don't know how long they had been there in, 19, in the summer of 1999, but I would imagine it was something like 1913 because they were rickety, they were weathered, they were rusty, they were old. I got tet tetanus once just from looking at it. Okay, that's what these tables look like. And it was at these tables that the girls would congregate and we would go and we would play basketball and try to impress them or I would bring my guitar and try to, I had much more success with the guitar than I did with my basketball skills, let me tell you. So we would go down there and that was the goal was to go down there and get these girls to do the one thing that teenage girls seem to never want to do to teenage boys, notice them. So, because we weren't brave enough to actually, you know, do the smart thing and, talk to them we wanted them to go who's that so we would come up with elaborate ways in which to get noticed cool pool had remained silent up to this point as to his ideas any ideas he had to remain silent but one thing he was certainly was not uh, was not quiet about was this cool pool had it bad for gina Gina, who in my opinion at the time was one of the prettier girls at camp that year, and this is a camp with about three to 400 kids at it. She was one of the prettier girls. Um, Coolpool really liked Gina bad. Gina 
seemed to not really know that Cool Pool even existed. So we were talking, we were trying to give him all sorts of ideas of various varying degrees of extremeness of how to get Gina's attention. And he wasn't really having, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Hey, do this. No, I don't know. Hey, do that. No, I don't know, I don't know. And we, look, we all got really into this story. Even though some of us liked Gina, we were kind of, we were kind of so invested in this, this love story between Cool Pool and Gina that a lot of us stepped back and said, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that Cool Pool gets this girl. Well, Cool Pool goes off script one day. We're down at the basketball court. We're all playing basketball la- uh, badly, except for me, I'm playing guitar really badly. <laughs> and nothing's working, nobody's getting Gina's attention. Certainly, Cool Pool's not getting Gina's attention. Until Cool Pool, shy, quiet Cool Pool, decides that he's going to stop the game in progress. He gets past the ball, he grabs it, and he says, Guys, hold up! And he waits. He holds the ball up to get everybody's attention. And he says it real loud. Everybody, boy and girl alike, looks at Cool Pool. He now has the floor. He says, Guys, I'm going to dunk it. Now, as I said, dirt court, but regulations height hoops. Cool pool is 15. He's about 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, we didn't need Albert Einstein to show up and tell us how this is not going to happen. We're all, we, we all try to communicate this to him. We're kind of laughing, but still trying to save face because Gene is watching. We're going up saying, <laughs> yeah, okay, don't do this. <laughs> what do you think? Don't, this is no, this isn't going to work. And he goes, no, I'm going to dunk it. He, and my buddy Jeff, who was a legitimately good basketball player, was trying to explain to him the impossibility of how this is going to happen. He said, there's no way you're getting up there, man. What, what, what are you going to do? Are you going to grow wings? You, 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 can't, you can't, then you're going to look like an idiot in front of this girl. Don't do this. And he goes, don't worry. Famous last words. Don't worry, I have a plan. Cool Pool hands the ball to Jeff. He goes over to one of the four picnic tables that have been out there since 1913. He drags it onto the court. As he is dragging this table, the boards making up both the seats and the top are doing this rattling like as, as he's dragging it across the rough dirt he positions it long long ways in front of the hoop he then goes up to jeff and says give me the ball jeff looks at me as if to say what do i do here and i look at jeff and go He hands Jeffrey the ball. Or Jeffrey hands him Cool Pool the ball. He goes to the other end of the court. There's a hush silence over the crowd at this point. We are just watch like the Olympics is happening in front of us. We are watching this. He goes to stand under the opposite hoop. He has the ball. And then he takes a deep breath and he bolts for the table. He doesn't dribble. He just runs. And he's, he's running, and he takes a hopping leap. Our breaths catch as he leaves the ground to go atop the table. He makes it to the top of the table. We're watching in just pregnant, you know, tension as he runs across the table. His right foot lands on the, on the second board to the middle and goes through. Snap! He tumbles and does this. And none of us are saying, we go, oh. And he goes down. He goes off to the side, misses the table, and lands shoulder first onto the dirt. 
and goes, ah, ah, and everybody goes, oh. We all circle around him as if we know what to do. We're down there looking at him. Cool pool, are you okay? What we didn't know at the time is that Cool Pool had just broken his right arm. All we knew at the time was what Cool Pool decided to share with us at the time, and it was this, because he still has the ball. Ah, oh, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. In fact, I think I can try it again. <laughs> Jeff, standing next to me, my best friend, looks down and goes, starts to, starts to say, cool pool, no, don't, do, don't, you should, we should go get the nurse or stand, don't, don't, don't do, and I go, no, let it happen, because now I am invested <laughs> in this story. We help him up. Jeff takes the ball again. We help him up. He dusts himself off with his one good arm. He looks at Jeff and says, give me the ball. Jeff looks at me and I go. He hands, Je Jeffrey hands Cool Pool the ball. He leaves the table. <laughs> the same table that was just broken by the first attempt remains in front of the goal. He goes to the backcourt again, now holding the basketball in his left arm. Again, no dribble. Runs. Jumps. Breaks another board. Tumbles. Lands. Breaks his other arm. Now, it's over. Now Cool Pool knows it's over. <laughs> we go and get Stan Craig, <laughs> who has to drive this kid the hour and a half to the closest emergency room. Cool Pool comes back six hours later with two casts. While he is gone, Jeff and I track Gina down, who saw the whole thing. We corner her in the cafeteria. Jeff and I are pleading on Cool Pool's behalf. Gina, we know you don't like him. We like him, mostly because of what just happened. But we know you don't. The guy broke both of his arms, Gina. Give a man a break. She says, what do you want me to do, Jared? Give him your number. Just that. You don't have to go out with him. Just give him your number. It will make it all worth it. She never gave him the number. She never even talked to him the entire week. Do you know what the purest form of love is? Unrequited. Unrequited love. Meaning love that is given but not returned. I think we've all been there. I've had my own adventures romantically with that word, unrequited. I remember one Sunday morning, me looking at my then girlfriend, my then, you know, early high school girlfriend. Her name was Erin. And I, got, I, I managed to get her alone for a few moments, and I said, Erin, I love you. And she said, oh, thank you. And I went, I, that's, that's the response you get when you give somebody a greeting card. I just put myself out there on the line for you, girl, and you said thank you? Unrequited. We've all had our hearts broken. We've all felt that feeling. We've all, and not just in the romantic circle. I think we've all been there even as parents from time to time, right? Where you love your kid, but maybe your kid's having a hard time loving you back, right? I hate you, Dad! 
That doesn't feel good, does it? We've all felt unrequited love. But who can say they felt unrequited love more than God? Because think about it, church. If you do the math, the majority of the love that God feels for his creation is unrequited. Only a small percentage of those whom God loves love him back. Imagine what that must feel like. You know, we read this verse in John chapter 3. We read it and we think to ourselves, this is a happy verse. This is a verse of joy. This is a, a, a verse of hope. We read it and we feel good about ourselves. We read those words, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Aww. Oh, thank you. Isn't God so nice and sweet? Have you read the rest of this passage? Because Jesus doesn't stop talking after he says that. Consider this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world may be, might be saved through him. Okay, that word condemn is it's throwing me a little bit, but you know, still at least it's got the word saved in it. Verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. That's good. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the, whole, of the only Son of God. And verse 19, now remember, this is the most famous verse in the Bible specifically because of the love that it mentions. Verse 19, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Because they loved darkness, rather than light. I once saw a counseling scenario where a mother was desperately looking for her 19-year-old daughter. And she was in counseling because she found her living homeless on the streets swallowed up in prostitution and drugs. She said that she went and found her daughter on the street. She, she tracked her down. And she said she looked completely different. She had lost a bunch of weight. Her cheek and eyes were sunken in. She was filthy. She was hanging out with men who were clearly only interested in her, and, and her for one thing only. And she tracked her down, she cornered her, and she said, Sweetie, it's me, Mom. Come home. I love you. These people don't love you. I love you. She said, no, Mom. No. Because your love comes with rules.
Just come home. It'll be fine. No. If I come home, can I bring Tony with me? Of course not. If I come home, can I use like I can use here? Of course not. I'm fine where I am. Church, can you imagine what that must feel like? I think we forget when we read John 3.16, we forget that this is the same God who also inspired the book of Hosea. Hosea was chosen by God to be an object lesson, a living object lesson. Now, I don't know how you feel about the idea of being called as a prophet of God and what that would entail for you. But for for Hosea, it meant this. God called Hosea and says, you will take a wife, and this is the word, I'm quoting scripture here. You will take a wife of whoredom. You will marry a prostitute. And you will love her, and you will have children with her. But she will be unfaithful to you. Here's what Hosea had to do, y'all. He would get his wife, Gomer, who he did love, and he, who, whom he had married, and he never divorced her. What would happen is she would leave home and go and sell herself to strangers on the street. She would auction off her own body to these men. And you know what Hosea would have to do? Instead of getting mad and saying, I'm done with you, forget it, it's over, we're through, I'm getting the kids. You know what God commanded Hosea to do? Go down to that auction block, go down to that street corner, take your money and buy her back. Get into a bidding war with the men who are there to use her as an object of gratification. Outbid them. And she did that over and over and over. And you know what the lesson was? God was communicating this to Isaiah. You, to Hosea, you tell the people that you now know a little bit of what it's like to be me. Imagine loving a child that doesn't love you back. Imagine loving a spouse that couldn't care less about you, but being so in love with them, that it aches. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But there's an interesting phrase here. It says this. He did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. And whoever believes in the son will will not be condemned, but be saved. But whoever does not believe, I find this shattering, church. Whoever does not believe will not be saved because he is condemned already. You know why God didn't send his son to condemn the world? Oh, he's just such a nice God. Because he doesn't have to. Because the world was already condemned to start with. If somebody needs saving, they don't need to be put in danger so that they can be saved, right? You're already dangling from the cliff. You're already at the top floor of a building that is on fire. You're already on the deck of a sinking ship. We don't need to make the ship sink again. It's already sinking. Church, you came here this morning 
You came here this morning hopefully convinced that God loves you, and He does. He loves each and every person in this room, in this building, in this city, in this state, in this country, in this world. He loves all of them. All of them enough to die. Maybe you get hope from that. Maybe you think to yourself, wow, I'm sure glad God loves me. Great. Why don't you love him back? Where does Jesus find you? Like that mother, he finds you on the street corner. And he sees what sin has done to your life. And he says, come home. Just come with me right now. I love you. Look at what I paid to come and find you. Please. No. Your love comes with rules. The purest form of love Love to its fullest is not sacrificial. It's not parental. It's unrequited. Amen? Don't let God's love be unrequited for you. He has given you so much. The least you can do is love him back. If you have the opportunity now to love God back, and all you have to do is come while we stand and sing.